Thank you, everyone, for the great discussion. And uh, now my pleasure to uh, introduce Fadi Ghandour, the CEO of Aramex, <laughs> who clearly needs no introduction. So, Fadi, thank you again for thank you all, all your support. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good evening. Good afternoon. Um, I want to say that I'm going to say that I'm going to say that I'm going to speak English. And I'm not going to say that I'm 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 going to say that I will, I will bypass your enthusiasm for the language. But let me talk. If you allow me, today I would like. I'm going to switch to English. So I, I'd like to uh, just give you my thoughts. Uh, I'm going to give you my thoughts. 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 I'm going to give you my uh, these are my thoughts, my worries. Uh, these are worries that governments should think about, uh, the private sector should think about, and each and every one of you should think about. You might disagree with me, you might uh, agree with me, but that's the idea of us having a discussion, and I just found the discussion so empowering, uh, the earlier panel, uh, so empowering, so energizing that uh, and reconfirming some of the things that I have to, uh, I would like to, uh, to say to you. So seismic, seismic shifts uh, uh, as powerful as the earthquake in Japan has happened in the Arab world and maybe probably much more uh, lasting and much more powerful and much more uh, disquieting for us. So on the one side, we're, we're excited. We're, uh, we're, there's a sense of jubilation. There's a sense of empowerment but there is also a massive sense of uh, the unknown. And uh, a combination of both is, uh, is, 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 is a paradox of, of worry, but then maybe a sense of, uh, uh, of achievement eventually, of coming and uh, of reaching uh, where we want to, to reach. So let me talk about maybe 14 or 15 points that I think are of, 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 uh, of importance for us that uh, are shifts from what was pre-Egypt, uh, pre-Tahrir Square, to post-Tahrir Square. What do I think we need to, wh where are we moving from, in my view? So we're clearly moving from big to small, very clearly. The Tahrir, square, the Tahrir story is a story of the individual, the empowerment of the individual beating the big government, big, small. Private equity, privatization, small and medium-sized enterprises are in vogue. No more privatizations, much more entrepreneurial startups. No more real estate projects, much more entrepreneurship. No more worrying that big brother is watching, even though he is. We're still going out there. Because, you know, um, this, the, what, what, uh, what we heard earlier uh, about the slowness of the internet is, is because somebody's watching. Somebody's watching. So at the, at the one side, uh, uh, the social media is empowering. On the other side, it means we're out there uh, uh, exposed. So it is also from the company to the employee. For those of us that are running companies, We'd better use our ears very carefully because the employees are empowered. And Facebook is not about only the citizen coming out and addressing his issues. It is about your employees. It's about your people going out and facing your issues. So you're either listening to them or they're going to go on Facebook and you'd better address the issues. We're seeing across the Arab world employees in companies rising up, empowered by Tahrir Square. My, our own employees in Aramex in Cairo, I will share this with you, rose up right after the Tahrir and said, Thuwar Aramex demand the following. So, yes, they are empowered. 
So you'd better listen to them. So, big to small. From father, this is my second idea, from father knows best, to the children are out online connecting. From fathers, from bureaucracies, from hierarchies, from command and control and discipline, to chaos and risk and venture. The Arab individual's median age is 26 years old, ladies and gentlemen. Average Arab is 26 years old, younger than Mubarak's rule. And by the time they're 10 years old, by the time they're 10 years old, the internet revolution has started, which means the, the, the average Arab was born and became aware of life with the internet. It's not my age where I watched TV and wasted my time doing that. These people are connected. So discipline, hierarchy, al-haram, in Alab. It is the other way around. It is much more risk because the 26-year-old doesn't think he's going to lose much. You better watch that and watch that very carefully. From deafening silence, from deafening silence, to here comes everybody. Clay Shirky wrote a book. For those of you who know Clay Shirky, he's a brilliant. If you want to read about social media, you read the book called Here Comes Everybody. It is the power of social media. There was a big, uh, Samir talked about Gladwell, but there was a big debate for those of you who followed it between Gladwell and, and, uh, and Shirky about the power of social media in revolutions. Uh, so here comes everybody means when everybody thought that the Arab citizen was silent and definitely silent and questioning why is it that people are not rising to suddenly people that are connected. The, the social media is about connecting people, is about empowering people, it's a tool. It, it's not, it's not going to create revolutions, but it's going to tell me that there is somebody there that thinks like me and I'm going to connect with him and we're going to meet in Tahrir Square. That's all. And the rest is left. So when here comes everybody to Tahrir Square, we know what happens. So there is no more silence. There is a, a very loud, very loud change. From evolution, we were taught, we were taught my generation, and we lobbied for my generation, and the private sector, who thinks they're reformers, lobbied for what we called evolution. So we wanted change, but we wanted evolutionary change. You want to change the education system? Let's do it very slowly, because we're worried. We want to change the investment the climate. We are going to do it very slowly, because the system cannot take quickness. Well, today, from evolution to revolution. If we don't understand what happened on the ground, and the requirement of quickness, the requirement, those of us that compete in the private sector understand the importance of being quick, being revolutionary, doing it now. Right now, there's no reason for us to wait. So, no more evolution. The Arab world cannot wait. The education system cannot wait. Cannot wait any longer to empower the youth. It is not manageable. It is not doable. We need to be much more quick about it. And from the derogatory word of the youth bulge, this is my fifth item, youth bulge. Uh, with every conference I go to, they talk about the youth bulge. So it's like, يا أخي شو هالشغل اللي متعبتنا بالشباب كأنه الشباب عبء علينا فاكتشفنا العبء وقدرته على التغيير ف from the youth bulge to youth power from from the reformers in the system that thought we were worried about what to do about the youth and we wanted to do it in an evolutionary manner. The youth went down to the streets and said, we want to change now. So youth power. And, from, uh, and connected to that, the sixth item is, we were taught for the past 10 years that the UNDP Arab Human Development Report 
was telling us the full story about the Arab world, meaning the Arab world doesn't read, doesn't empower women, it doesn't do that, it doesn't do this. Every single person, and I have a lot of respect for them, that wrote the Arab Human Development Report, were, all ten, were 10 years older, the Arab media age, at least, if not 20, if not 30, if not 40. Nothing against age, but they, they were born 20 years after the internet revolution, which means they were not clicking. So yes, the Arab world does not necessarily read, yes, the Arab world does not necessarily read books, but they didn't know that they were reading Facebook. The Arab youth were reading Facebook. They were looking in the wrong place for what the Arabs were reading. They were reading Facebook, they were reading Twitter, they were reading uh, all sorts of social media, they were online. The Arab world is online. I want to read to you, for you uh, some statistics that I have been meaning to read from the beginning and I forgot about uh, the, the recently Asda, if those of you know Asda, issues every year something called the uh, Arab Youth Survey, which they published just last week. So they interviewed people from the age of 18 to 24, 2,000 of them, representative sample across the Arab world. And if you want to, to hear some of the statistics related to, uh, to the deficits and where the Arabs read, 80%, 80% of regional youth say they use the internet on a daily basis, which was up from 56% in 2009. Massive change. And I heard that the Google fellow gave uh, Mr. Uh, Hamzawi gave a brilliant uh, presentation earlier about what, where the Arabs go and what do they search. But 80% of Arab youth say that they are on the web. So they're reading. Whether we like what they're reading or not is another story altogether. It's not about, it's not about the, in, the intellectual left to tell us what we need to write, nor about the people on the right uh, what we need to read, or, or people anywhere. They're going to tell us what we need to read. We will read what we want to read, and the youth is doing what they want to do anyway. So we are not in a hierarchical father knows best, mother knows best, intellectual knows best. It is about me going out and being empowered and searching. And if I choose to go to Tahrir Square, then I'm going to go. Whether my father says yes or he says no, whether he wants to stay home, whether, whether he wants to drive me there. So from top down change, I am one of those people who thought top down, the only way to change was top down. And we know that it is no longer top down. It is people that are voting with their feet, with their clicks every single day. It is a bottom up change process. It means people know what they want. If we thought people didn't know what they want, and father knows best, and authority knows best, and the CEO knows best, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it is basically saying that people are connected, they're aware, and they're totally, totally empowered and know what they want. So change is from the bottom and can only happen from the bottom and the top needs to connect with the bottom so that both go together. When the top does not connect with the bottom, then we're in divergence and we know what that means and how we will, we will, uh, and that, that uh, uh, how we will end up. Um, I also would like to say that from government jobs, from government job seekers to, uh, empower, uh, um, uh, to, to entrepreneurship. People think that everybody wants to become a government employee, specifically in the Gulf. It's not true. Let me read a statistic for you uh, 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 from, uh, from the survey. So it says 51% of all regional youth say they intend to start their own businesses in the next five years. 51%. With entrepreneurial, this is, by the way, the survey was done over two periods, right before Tahrir, and then they had to update it immediately after Tahrir in Egypt. And you know, a couple of points were changed. In some areas, they, th they thought that pre-Tahrir, we would like to look for a government job. After Tahrir, the survey results changed. People wanted to be entrepreneurs. They felt empowered. They felt that risk is okay. So 51% of all regional youth intend to start their own businesses in the next five years with entrepreneurial ambition. Most pronounced where, believe it or not, 90% in Saudi Arabia. 
90% of the Saudi youth said we would like to start our business in the next five years. That's extremely, one, it's surprising to me, and two, it is very empowering because that means we, our, our mental models don't necessarily uh, fit 66% in Oman and 64% in the UAE. And believe it or not, in the Levant, it is much lower than the Gulf where us Levantines think we are much more entrepreneurial, especially in Lebanon, when not really. Uh, well, at least to this survey, so don't blame me. I am only the messenger here, so, and I am a sort of Lebanese at one point. Uh, and I'm proud of that, thank you. From, uh, and then, uh, what I'd like to, to hear uh, today in, in, in the earlier panel here, about the power of women. And, and those of you who have been following the, the, the revolutionary change, it is the women that have been at the front line. So for those of us who think the woman should belong in the kitchen, raising children, they don't belong there. They belong at the front line of the change process. The front line of the change process. The woman in Yemen, believe it or not, I forgot her name, I wanted so badly to remember her name, but in Yemen, the first person that got people on the ground was a woman. And her husband in an interview said, my job here is to make sure that she can do her work without worrying about the home. That's very empowering, that's very empowering. So in the Arab world, if we want to have change, follow the woman. Uh, 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 and, and, and for those of you men, I know you do that anyway, but for the wrong reasons. Uh, uh, from, from exclusive and closed systems to open, to open systems. It's no longer exclusive to a certain bunch of people where wealth is going to be generated. generated uh, wealth generation is going to be democratized across the region, has to be democratized across the region, and cannot be uh, uh, in a rentier state system. We don't want to be dependent on the state to make our living. We want the state to be an enabling institution, and we want it to be open, and we want competition to be the last statement on who stays and who doesn't. Not my relationship, or my father, or my mother, or my brother, or my friend, who is going to empower me to get business. So, from exclusive systems to open systems. You will not see it maybe now, maybe I'm a bit too idealistic, but watch that space very carefully. It is the competitiveness. It is tied in completely with entrepreneurship. It is a mindset that says the best will survive. The people who are able to provide the solutions at the right cost in a democratic fashion are the people that are going to make it. And then from promise, this is my 11th item, if, if any of you is counting, from, from promise to delivery. We've heard too many promises, and we're sick and tired of promises. If you don't walk the talk, you are irrelevant. If you don't walk the talk, you are irrelevant. So promise is not enough. Of it's not enough. If you don't deliver on your promises, then you lose your credibility. And in, Ara in the Arab world, governments, businessmen, CEOs, entrepreneurs, anything, you take it across the board, it is about the delivery. It is about the delivery. It's not about the business plan entrepreneurs here, all my friends, the entrepreneurs. We all read many business plans. It's how you're going to execute that business plan. Your business plan is your promise. I want to see how you're going to deliver it. Government says we want to change and do this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like having like having broadband in Lebanon. The ultimate promise. The ultimate promise. So instead of megawatts, we want megabytes. <laughs> in Lebanon, I can be a little bit revolutionary and maybe make it outside the place in one piece. But um, so. A couple of more points, and I will, I will let you go. So from the welfare state to the connected, empowered city or state. 
So for those of us who are happy and excited about how much money the state is throwing at us, yes, it's good. Yes, it's good to share wealth, but we want to create our own wealth. We don't want the wealth to be given to us. We want to run with it. We want to sweat for it. We want to be educated so that we're empowered. So the cities that are connected, the cities that are competitive, the cities that are open, the cities that have a proper education system, we're talking cities, even, we're even talking communities. People will move to these places. You want to return, retain your talent if you want to have people stay inside your city, even if they are multinational. So we're also always worried, you know, Dubai is multinational. Oh yes, it's multinational, it's connected, and it's very competitive in many ways. There's nothing wrong with that. Beirut would, would do very well if it becomes a little bit as connected as Dubai is, so that it's an open system. There's nothing wrong with that. The world the, and the entrepreneurs and talented people will move to where their talent can be realized and can be effective. So, the welfare state, even though Hatta in Egypt, I'm hearing a lot about how the state needs to go back to become a provider, I think this is on the short run. On the long run, the Egyptians are going to be much more entrepreneurial, just like they felt they own their country. They can own their future individually by being entrepreneurs and not necessarily depending on the state to provide. The state can be, have a safety net and it can be competitive at the same time. They don't clash together. There could be a much more humane capitalism than we had seen before. So, from, from, in my view, from xenophobic tribes, from xenophobic tribes in our states, to global and regional geeks. I think that's what social media does. It has created global tribes, regional tribes, people that are connected together. The people of January 25th in Cairo were putting hashtag, hashtag for the Tunisian, for Bouazizi. They were putting January 25th, hashtag January 25th and Bouazizi. It means somebody connected, even though they might not necessarily know each other, but somewhere they connected. There's one tribe, one language, one issue, one feeling of empowerment. One feeling of empowerment. So, and even this survey confirms it to me, and I want to uh, read it for you, which was a bit surprising uh, for myself. Uh, it said, number 12 here, just give me one second, six, number 12. In the survey it says, um, the concept of glo global citizenship, citi citizenship is increasingly important to Arab youth, especially those outside the GCC. But here's, here's the conclusion. It says, both GCC youth, 62%, uh, uh, both non-GCC youth at 62% and GCC youth at, 40, uh, at 41% say the idea that of global citizenship is important to them. The global citizenship means I am not, nationalism is not suffocating for me. I can be a nationalist, I can love my country, but I can feel that I am connected to the global world. That is so essential, that is so empowering, that, is, that means we're, we're, we're much more positive. And then I will need to tell you a couple of things that have come out in the survey. It says, connected to liberalism, it says here, the political views of the youth are increasingly, increasingly liberal and forward-looking. For those of us who are worried about the Islamic Muslim Brotherhood tide that was not necessarily in some of our views, it says that 51% of regional youth now say they are politically liberal up from 20% in, uh, in the previous survey. So 51% say they're liberal. What liberal means is another story altogether. We will need to think about that in a later uh, talk. But it also says the following. Youth in Lebanon are the most liberal, obviously, at 72%, followed by youth in Iraq and Jordan at 67%. Egyptian youth, Egyptian youth are more liberal than they were, than they were in January, in January 2000, and 11, so pre-Tahrir, they were, they were saying that they were 3% liberal. When the youth were surveyed pre-Tahrir, 3% of them said we're liberal. Post-Tahrir, 26% said, well, you know, we are liberal. What that means, how, how seriously we take that number, it's something for us to think about. It's some, something that tells us 
people are constantly changing their minds. Their, the ideology is not, does not stick. Ideology is about solutions. If a solution is not provided in a certain ideology, then the youth will move on because they want solutions. And then, uh, number 14, and that's about leadership. So, from speaking, that's in my view, because I speak a lot, so I need to remind myself of it, and I talk all the time. So, from speaking and talking to stay relevant, to using your ears much more than your mouth. So, listening, for those of us who didn't listen, did not expect a revolution. For the fathers who don't listen to their kids because they think they don't know, they have told us that they know much better, that they are much more empowered. So, so if a leader is somebody that needs to stay relevant all the time, and staying relevant means I'm going to have to listen much more. So uh, I think the trends of the future is that we say less and listen more. Say less and listen more. And that's, uh, I'm talking to governments also. Don't talk to us too much. Listen to us a little bit. Maybe we can help you in doing your job better. And then last but not least, uh, number 14, and, and that relates to what, uh, what is called CSR and the role of, the, of private sector in development. I think CSR is truly bull, and don't take it seriously. And don't ever say that you do CSR unless you really mean that you are involved in real, real developmental work. So if you're doing CSR because you want to make your company look good, we're not interested. Because the private sector, to remain relevant, and the lessons of Egypt for the private sector, because a lot of my friends in the private sector in Egypt are no longer in Egypt today. So if the private sector wants to remain relevant, it needs to be independent, it needs to be loud, and it needs to be very seriously looking at what it wants to do about the issues that face their society and not think of their profitability as their only reason for existence. Because, because we will become irrelevant. We will become irrelevant, we will be thrown out, and we will not be true citizens to our nation. So, yes, you need to be profitable to be sustainable, but you need to be strategically thinking about the development of society that you live in, and in the well-being of society, which is something I say all the, all the time, you will find the well-being of your organization. A, a company that lives in a society that is miserable is a miserable company. It will not make it, and then when the people rise, you are going to be the first victims of that. So take that lesson very seriously. These are my 15 points that I am thinking about but I need to share with you a couple, of, a couple of issues in the survey which I think is very relevant for you to think about that came out in the survey. So, the most important item when the youth were surveyed, the number one item of their concerns, you know what? Is that they are in love with democracy. 80% of Arab youth said they want to live in a democratic system. They are talking to us. They are telling us we want to live in a democratic. What the definition of democracy for each society is a different story. But democracy means, in my view, in its simplest manner, sharing in the decision-making process about our future. It's very simple. How we share and how seriously we share is something that each society needs to decide on, but democracy is, is, uh, uh, is essential. Uh, and then the number, the number two item is anxiety about the cost of living. The youth are very anxious about the cost of living. Taban, cost of living relates to uh, jobs uh, and, and, uh, uh, and where in the Gulf it's different than in the Levant, but cost of living is an issue, is a serious issue. But more important is that you find that this, even pre-Tahrir, it even improved after Tahrir, and people said democracy still remains our number one, uh, our, our number one item. So, and then they're concerned about the gap between rich and poor. The number three item on the agenda of the youth is that there is a big gap between the rich and the poor. And this, this message is to the private sector. This is the private sector. How do we create wealth? How do we share it? How do we make sure there is more wealth uh, 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 around? Number, another a couple of items that I think are still relevant to you. The education, so, which is very empowering. Youth in the Gulf specifically, 63% all want to go to college and all want to go and do postgraduate work. Very empowering. People appreciate much more the power of, of, of education. Um, and then 
very important, 47% of the youth said they would like to work in, in private sector, and 43%, and 40% said they'd like to work in the private sector, in the public sector. That's changed from a year ago, and that changed even after Tahrir, as I had mentioned to you uh, uh, earlier. So, specifically, by the way, in Saudi Arabia, most Gulf Arabs, especially Saudi youth, 79% pre-Tahrir said they want to work in government, and then post, they said they'd like to be entrepreneurs. So something to think about, I don't know what it means, but this, these are the, the items that the survey uh, 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 mentioned. And by the way, 20% of, of the Arab youth are connected to social media, that's what they say. 20% say uh, we are connected. 18% actually read blogs uh, and connected to social, uh, uh, to social media. Uh, 60, sorry, 60% 60 say they are connected to social media and 18% say they read blogs. So if they don't need read newspapers, they're reading blogs. So they're reading somewhere about something. So these are uh, the last items I thought I'd share with you what, what, what we need to worry about as we go in the future. I thank you very much for listening to me.